glad that you're here this morning. Welcome. Let me say happy Thanksgiving. And we're turning our attention from Thanksgiving, obviously, to Advent, the time of preparation leading up to Christmas. And so this service today is really designed to help kind of transition our thinking, our mind, preparing our hearts for Christmas. My prayer for you is the same I want for my family. I pray that this Christmas season would be the best one you've ever had, right? Now, for some of you, you are like all in on Christmas. You know who you are. You already started it. You started decorating your house November 1st, 2016, right? You're ready. You're thinking like years ahead. You're all in. You know what I mean? You can't wait right now. I mean, you wore what you wore to church, but you wanted to wear an ugly sweater you, and it lit up. You know, you know who you are. You're all in. This is what you think about. You're so excited. Some of you can't wait. It's a wonderful life, particularly it's wonderful if you're in a stage of life where kind of everybody's healthy, you know what I mean? You got the families all going to be there together. You still like each other, you know. Uh, if, if there's always seems to be like, when it comes to your table, there's always enough and enough to share. You know what I mean? You're just in a season where it's a wonderful life, right? Which you've been watching since June. For others, okay, it could be, it could be, there's no major trauma in your life. It could be it's a wonderful life were it not for Pinterest. What I mean is, you're so stressed. Like, instead of the holidays being about, you know, what they're supposed to be about, it's this incredible amount of stress, and there, it's hard to keep from being a little bit bitter that it's a wonderful life for everybody else, and I have to work so hard to make it a wonderful life for all of you, right? You know, uh, the, you know the, the shopping and the presents and the gifts and the, 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 the hustle and bustle, and it, it'd be, it could be a wonderful life, but you're stressed. And then there's this third group where the holidays... Uh, Quite honestly, there, it, it's not a wonderful life at all. Uh, for those of you that um, have lost a loved one, for example, uh, the holidays are a real time of grieving. And especially if you lost a family member maybe this year, you know what it's like, right? That you had the first Thanksgiving where grandpa wasn't at his seat in the table and it broke your heart. Or, or for those of you who faced the loss of a spouse, you go, how am I going to get through Christmas? And the longest night of the year, you know, right around the December 20s, they really are not just a long night of the year. It's a long night for your soul and it's a, a, a really difficult time for anybody who's in the throes of addiction. For those that struggle with substance abuse, abuse of drugs or alcohol, the, the holidays are like an open season on temptation. It's a very difficult season, and the holidays are full of temptation and threat or for some grief and pain. And so when, when we think about preparing our hearts for the holidays, people are coming at all different angles, and I wanted to find some hope. I, ironically, our message, hope to prepare our hearts for this holiday season, a classic Christmas text full of hope, Ecclesiastes. <laughs> now, for those of you who know your Bibles, you're laughing because you're going, this is not a text that is usually associated with hope. For those of you who are less familiar, turn to Ecclesiastes. I've got the verses up here on the screen. Ecclesiastes is a, 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 a book in the Bible <clears throat> where... Really, you've got this incredible experiment that's happening. It's written by this guy. He calls himself the seeker or the preacher or the quester, the one who goes on a quest. The Hebrew is Kohelet. It's a little hard to know exactly how to translate this. But the idea is you've got somebody. Uh, you know, s some people attribute this as a work of King Solomon who had all this wisdom and riches. And that very well could be. But the point is... You've got somebody who's got the, rich, the riches and the, the power and the, the resources and the time to go on this grand experiment, this grand quest of what it is exactly that can ultimately fulfill the human heart. What is that central focal point of life around which everything else can orbit and it will all come to attention, everything else will come to attention, everything else will fall into place. What is that thing that will ultimately and finally fulfill the desires of the human heart? You know, so the, the writer of Ecclesiastes has, has heard people say, oh, money can't buy happiness. Well, he's going to find out for himself. 
right? Or, hey, good looks aren't everything. Well, he's going to find out for himself. He wants to know, are these just cliches that people say? Or what is it? He's got the time, he's got the power, he's got the resources to go on this grand experiment where he looks through every single place he can possibly find, anywhere he's ever heard that that's the real meaning of life, if you can just get that. And so he, he does just that. He does this one-time experiment, once for all eternity, by the way. None of you should feel the need to go on this same quest. Like, he did it. You, you don't have to. It's, it's, okay, it's been done. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, we'll start. He says, I, I said in my heart, he starts, starts with sort of the usual suspects, right? I mean, he starts with uh, pleasure, uh, uh, partying, you know, uh, uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know the drill. He, go, he goes there, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He says, I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, how'd it turn out? This also was vanity. Vanity's a theme in the book of Ecclesiastes. It means it's... Uh, Nothing. It turned out to be nothing. Just the chasing after the wind. In other words, he says there's a point where this party lifestyle gets old. I said of laughter, it's mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Now, so far... And you see, I'm moving over this very quickly. Very few people need to be convinced of this first point, right? I mean, he goes through a, a sort of a, a spring break on steroids, right? I mean, he just has this wild party lifestyle. And lo and behold, realizes, you ready? Shocking, this stuff can't fulfill. Most people are not all that shocked by this. Right? So, so a life of sensual pleasure and hedonism doesn't in the end fulfill, you wind up a uh, meaningless vanity. Most people are not, like I said, not shocked by this. They're not surprised. After a short while, that lifestyle gets old, and, and we begin to think, well, there's, there's got to be more. So he moves on to a building program, right? I made great works. I built houses. Some of you have built a house. I planted vineyards for myself. And some of you are gardeners. I made myself gardener, gardens. Some of you have built gardens. And parks. None of you built a park. Planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. So Solomon's like, any of you tried this? Yeah? Those crepe myrtles in the front? Yeah, that's great. I built a forest. Okay? With its own reservoir. Okay? So he took a building program to the extreme. He amasses power, prestige, and wealth. Look, I bought male and female slaves, had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who'd been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. He's got power, prestige, wealth. He's trying to say, whatever you've tried, I've done it to the nth degree. Oh, you played Coldplay at your holiday party? Yeah, I bought Coldplay. You understand? Like, you, you, you're not going to step to this. He, he's clearly, he's, the power of the wealth, verse 9, I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. That's important. He never forgot that he was on a grand experiment. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. All my toil. Okay. What's the verdict? You made it to the top? You're on the Fortune 500 list? Okay? Uh, paparazzi's always... Your life is one big rap video. I'm, you're you're balling, and you have this empire, and what, what, do you have, what do you have to say about all this? Verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Again, I'll say it. Most people probably could have predicted this first part, right? I mean, most, most people are saying, look, I, I get it. I, you, all this wild living and just fame and fortune and the pursuit of money, like, no kidding. You don't need the Bible for that. You just need, like, a Hallmark Christmas special, you, right? This is not, this is common sense. That wild living and fame and fortune and power, it's not all that. Most people are with you at that point, right? They go, yeah, 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 that's not going to fulfill. What confuses people is where Ecclesiastes goes next. 
Yeah, yeah, I get it. All that wild living and fame and fortune is just smoke. That's just chasing after the wind. What surprises me when I read it, what surprises a lot of people, is that not only sensual pleasure can't ultimately fulfill, but neither can many things that we think are quite good. So somebody says, hey, quit all that party living, settle down and get your education, get some wisdom. So Solomon says, okay, okay, I'll, I'll try wisdom. Verse 12, so I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what's already been done. Then I saw there is more gain in wisdom than in folly as there is more gain in light than in darkness. Okay, he thinks maybe we're, maybe we're on to something. It's better to be wise than to be a fool. So he's learning. Verse 14, the wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks around in darkness. It's like, yeah, that, that's great. So there's real value in wisdom, right? Look, and yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Get smart, or don't, you still die. This, so far, is a very uplifting sermon. Then, then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. Why have I been so very wise? Uh, there, I know there are some students who are home from college on break. Finals are coming up. There's some other students that are working hard. Under no circumstances, when your mom says you have to study, should you ever quote to her Ecclesiastes 2, verse 14 and 15. What happens to the wise happens to the fool. They still die. No, that's not. You, you can't say that. It's, Solomon can say that, but you can't say it. He, went, he, he passed. Uh, <clears throat> And so I said in my heart, this also is vanity, for of the wise, verse 16, for of the wise as of the fool, there's no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. I forgot to tell you that. Not only are you going to die, you're going to be forgotten. How the wise died just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after the wind. It's the most wonderful time of the year. What confuses many people about Ecclesiastes is not that money and power and fame and partying comes up empty. Fine. But so does wisdom. In the end, wisdom cannot be the central thing around which life can be governed. Well, what about this? What about hard work? Don't we tell our kids, hey, you know, it's not enough to have, you got to work hard. You got to have a work ethic. It's not just partying and fame and fortune. You got to have wisdom and hard work. So he tries hard work. Verse 18, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who'll come after me. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool, yet he'll be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. See what he's saying? Even if you work hard, you leave all that hard work to somebody else. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. I really intended this to be a Christmas sermon, like preparing our hearts. But you see, not only only are uh, uh, fame and fortune and wild living not going to cut it. We get that. Yeah, most people get that. But, but, But even like wisdom and hard work, even deeds, even good deeds, even like deeds of righteousness. Great, you still die. Go out, join the Peace Corps, feed the homeless. Even a life built on righteous works doesn't ultimately fulfill. So what does fulfill? Well, the writer of Ecclesiastes gives a little hint at the end of the book. And a lot of people in, in, uh, in, in our generation, a lot of people really gravitate to the book of Ecclesiastes because it speaks with such a, a, a modern voice. It really connects with where people are at. They, they're looking around. They, can't, they have all this stuff, but they, it doesn't fulfill. So he gives this giant hint in the closing verses of the book. He says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, I put the, the verse up here, the last verse. The end of the matter, all has been heard. What does it come down to? What's the conclusion? He says... Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. 
What he's saying here, what he hints at is more than all these other things, you need a connection with God. You need a relationship with God, but not just any relationship with God. Not a relationship with God of your own design, but rather a relationship which puts God at the center and everything has to orbit around him. Everything has to be centered. That's that stuff about fear God and keep his commandments. A life oriented around God. One in which you have granted God ultimate authority. Now, what on earth? That's what he's saying. That's the conclusion. These other things cannot sustain. What on earth does that have to do with the holiday? This. <clears throat> Often we think that Satan will tempt us with evil things to keep us away from God. All right, so these evil, gnarly, wicked things that you can smell from a mile away and they look evil and bad, right? So a lot of times we think Satan will tempt us with these evil things to keep us from God. What the writer of Ecclesiastes, I think, is pointing out is this. Satan oftentimes does not use evil things to keep you from God, but many times Satan will use good things to keep you from God. Oswald Chambers says it this way, the good is the enemy of the best. Does that make sense? In other words, these good gifts that God has given us, when, we're, when they're made the very center of our life, when everything orbits around them, they've actually been the very thing that keeps us from God. The good is the enemy of the best. Uh, think of it this way. Uh, uh, Satan doesn't have to destroy you if he can just distract you. Hmm? And fill your life up with all these little distractions, all of which can be perfectly good, but they're wicked if they keep you from the best. So Satan will use these good things as an enemy of the best. Now this is a complex theological truth, right? That Satan will use good things, the good because Satan's not a creator, right? Satan can't only God's a creator. Satan's just a fallen angel. He's a created being. So Satan can't like whip up a batch of evil. He can't create anything. All he can do is take God's good gifts and pervert them and twist them. Now watch this. What does this have to do? Look, 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 this is a complex theological truth that the good is the enemy of the best. But if you think, I can't get my head around that, don't worry. You've already seen this play out. If any of you have ever been to an all-you-can-eat buffet, you've seen this theological truth played out. That the good is the enemy of the best. Um, people see buffets differently, and I'll let you decide which kind of person you are. I, I, I know my wife and I are on different sides of this particular issue when we look at like a buffet and we go to an all-you-can-eat buffet. I won't say that it always breaks along gender lines, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's... It, 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 there are two ways to look at an all-you-can-eat buffet. For some, an all-you-can-eat buffet, and my wife looks at it this way, is a meal. Nothing more. But for me... It's a challenge, isn't it? It's me versus the house. And the house always thinks they can win, right? But they're not making money on me. If it's a $15 buffet, I'm eating 20, right? If I pay $10, I'm eating 12. If it's $20, I'm going for it until I run out of hungry. You understand? Uh, now, the, the, the good is the enemy of the best. There's some good food in this buffet, right? But if you fill up on this, they would never do this in Coleman. The buffets here, I'm sure, are way too classy. But there were some places in New York, I know they did this. I know they did this. They funneled the traffic where you would go and pick up your plate and the prime rib and the good stuff was down there at the end. All You can eat whatever you want. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet. But not all the items cost the restaurant the same amount of money. So when you start, you get your plate and you fill up with, I don't know, Green bean salad or something, right? It's good. I mean, it doesn't kill anybody. You know, it's all right. It's not evil. It's not wicked. But by the time I get to the good stuff, the expensive stuff, the stuff I really want, my plate is full. And I tell myself, oh, it's okay. I can always come back. But then I'm out of hungry, and I never do, and the house wins. That's how they get you, right? So you start there, and you fill up on the good, and you've missed the best, right? You missed out on prime rib because your plate's full of uh, green bean salad, right? It reminds me of the... <laughs> I was in Louisiana, and I was at a, a <laughs> I cannot tell this, uh, the, uh, uh, how do I, um, there was this couple, and they were, um, it doesn't matter, they were in front of me, I don't, I don't want to be ugly, but anyway, um, I'll never forget, <laughs> she takes the plate, and she looks at her, it, uh, it looked like they were about to do some serious business on this buffet, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and uh, she takes it, and this older couple, and she hands the plate to her husband, and she goes, 
Now, don't you go filling up on salad. <laughs> and I was like, that's a good woman. I mean, we, we, we call that person an enabler, I think. <laughs> that's what I've never forgotten that. But she's right. Don't let the good be the enemy of the best. So you make your way through this whole buffet, and in the end, you missed out on the best because you filled up on the end. There, 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 there's so many good things, and none of them are evil, but there, you missed out on the prime rib. You understand? You, you're filled up on green bean salad, and you missed out on the prime rib. If there's any vegetarians here, you filled up on the prime rib, and you missed out on that green bean salad. Because right? I want to be fair to all audiences. Vegetarian, just an old word, it means bad hunter. We, <laughs> they structure a buff, watch this, they structure the thing, they structure the thing so that you will fill up on the good and miss the best. Listen to me carefully. We're entering December. Your culture has structured. The powers of this world have aligned and they have created a, dis listen to me, they have created a culture, a consumeristic culture, wherein they have taken a lot of good things. Hmm? There's Jesus at the end of the buffet and we have a culture that will fill up on all these good things and miss the best. In fact, it occurs to me as I was preparing this message with all the uh, it gets earlier and earlier. I might, I might even be too late. Like, you know what I mean? Maybe I need to preach this at the end of September or something. Beca beca right? You see what I'm saying? There's this culture that's after your money where they structure what happens. Jesus becomes a quaint afterthought. And, and, and they get filled up. People get filled up on movies and lights and shopping malls and presents and all this good stuff. None of it's bad. It's good stuff. But Jesus becomes a quaint afterthought. And it is no wonder that on December 26, people are filled with depression. Why? Because they believed a false gospel of consumerism wherein you're told to fill your plate up with the good and you've missed out on the best. And shove to the side. It leaves you full but not fulfilled. And it leaves you emptier and emptier each year. And so each year, that's why you got to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like an arms race. It used to be you could just send a Christmas card. Now it has to have bells, whistles, and a live band that pops out and plays with your cute kid. Right? Why? It's gotten off the, off the chains. Why? Because it's so easy to fill up on what's good. So what can you do? What can my family do this year to ensure that Christmas is going to be about what it's supposed to be about. How do we prepare for that? How can my church family, church, what can you do? I'll tell you what to do. You got to grab a plate and start at the back of the buffet. Yeah. Yeah, you grab your plate, you bypass all that weak sauce, green bean salad, right? Forget that, right? You go down and you start with that prime rib, or you start with that favorite thing. You put that on the plate first. And that way, if something gets left out, it's some, you know, jelly, cran, apple, healthy thing, right? Not the good stuff, right, that gets left out. That's why, as a believer, you have got to commit, you've got to dedicate, you've got to do it now. You've got to start with Jesus. You've got to start with Jesus, then go to the lights and decorations. You start with Jesus, then you go to the holiday movies and the Christmas trees and the presents. You start with Jesus, then you go to that stuff. So if something gets left off your plate this holiday season, let it be the shopping mall and not the Lord. See? And if you start, if you'll do that, if you start with Jesus, here's the cool thing, here's the cool thing. All that other stuff makes sense. Just so you don't think I'm Mr. Grinch, watch this. If you start with Jesus as your fundamental commitment, you, you go to the back of the buffet. If you start with Jesus, watch this, all those holiday lights, they twinkle even brighter with real meaning, right? If you start with Jesus, then the music is so much more beautiful and meaningful. These things are, listen to me, they're good. Just don't let the good be the enemy of the best. That's the amazing thing about Solomon. The wisdom is good. The hard work is good. I'll even go so far to say what a lot of people forget. The pleasure that he experienced was good. It only got twisted when he decided to make it the central thing. But the, but the laughter and, the, and, the, and even the resources and the money and the building, none of that was wicked and bad, right? 
to fulfill all these things, it's like you got to work it backwards. you got to start with a fundamental commitment to Jesus Christ. And then the movies are fine. And, and the, the, you know, then it, it, whatever, it's a wonderful life. Yay, right? All these things are filled with. Otherwise, they're meaningless. Otherwise, without that, it, it's like Christmas is like a huge birthday bash with, with, with the birthday kid wasn't invited. I don't want anybody to miss out on the best part of the thing because they filled up on what's just good. Okay, so how do we do it? How do we do it? Very practically. Starting at the back of the buffet, everyone understands, is a metaphor. <laughs> right? You're like, I love this sermon, and I'm ready to not just be a hearer of the word, but I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to a buffet. Right, right, right. Th that's a metaphor. Okay, so how? Let's make it very specific and very application-oriented. Okay? This is a message in which I'm just quite frankly gonna get you know all up in your world and 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 tell you that, that, that here's how i think you apply this here's how i intend to apply it in my own family right now you've got your your plate your your december and like i said i, I may honestly i may even be too late but let's just assume that it's still at least a little bit clear there's a little bit room so how can we as a group of people ensure jesus priority jesus first on the plate uh, i just want to be super practical and i want to challenge you in three areas your plate made up of three areas. Um, your, your time. How can you prioritize Jesus Christ this holiday season with your time? Number two, your money. Money. Cash. Dollar bill. I, some people are like, sometimes they talk about money, but they call it stewardship. I don't want anybody to misunderstand. I'm literally talking about money. You're like, oh, that's awkward. I can be awkward about any subject, not just money. Don't, why, why has that ever stopped us? Your time, your money, and your attention. Your time, your money, and your attention. How can you prioritize Jesus in a very specific and applicable way this holiday season in those three areas? Now, there may be more, no doubt, but how are we going to do time, money, and attention? Uh, I, again, super practical, the most practical thing I could think to do, and I do not normally encourage this in church, but <clears throat> today, let's do it. Um, everybody, please take out your smartphone device. Go ahead, just take it out here. If you have a flip phone, have your friend crank the power while you take it out. I'm just kidding. Okay, just pull it out. If you don't have one, just look off for a friend. It'll be fine. <laughs> and open your calendar app, please. You can do it with your family there. Just open your... We're going to do time first. Time first. Okay. Let me just get to mine. There we go. Yep. Okay, go to December. I want you to notice there's five Sundays in December. Uh, the four leading up to Christmas are called the Sundays of Advent, traditionally. And uh, 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 December 3rd, 10, 17, 24, and the New Year's Eve's on a Sunday. Uh, uh, I would like you to uh, commit, right, church attendance. On the 24th, um, historically, um, the, okay, first off, Sunday morning worship. December 24th, Christmas Eve Sunday, so exciting. I know there's a lot of things to be doing on Christmas, but like the, 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 the Christian service of Christmas, eat, like the Sunday worship of the Lord in who the whole holiday is in his honor cannot be missed. So come to church. I'll see you. I mean, I have to. I'm, I get it. I'm paid to be here. But like everybody, right? You got December 24th, we got to be here. Historically, this church has had a Sunday evening service on the Sunday before Christmas called carols by candlelight it's the most awesome fire hazard of the year it's it's so good I love I actually got to be here last year okay uh that's the Sunday before uh, it's Christmas carols and carol light and it's the Sunday before on Christmas Eve historically this church that's when we observe the Lord's Supper one of the four times a year we observe Lord's Supper now watch this this year Christmas Eve is the Sunday before Christmas. So this year, that Sunday at 5 o'clock, go ahead and type it in your calendar, at 5 p.m. December 24th, carols and communion by candlelight. 5 o'clock. It's going to be about an hour service. You don't want to miss it, okay? Um, you, you've got family, plans. I get it. I know. I, don't choose them. Choose this. Uh, Jackie and I have family plans. We're, we're just delaying them. I know I'm a bad example. I get it. But, 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 but like, time prioritize now if not this this is not a guilt trip if not this something right if you're not a member here if you're just visiting fine where your church home is be with god's people and celebrate what you're doing is you're starting with the back of the buffet before somebody else fills up your calendar you're saying i want i want to honor the lord okay your time your money how can you honor the lord 
with your wealth. You still got your phone out? Uh, it, it, it is, this is not a full-blown sermon on giving. I have plenty of those. I, I, I do believe that God owns everything we have. We sang that in a hymn earlier. So there's a whole stewardship issue that goes into this. The point of my sermon is starting at the back of the buffet is how can I strategically plan ahead for time, for giving, and for attention. And so I thought for giving, I thought while you had your phone out, just this is sort of gimmicky, but um, this is the app, like uh, depending on the Sunday, oh, 10 to 30% of our giving comes in digitally. And I realize many of you are digital givers. And so if you want to give digitally, here's how you do it. The app is called Secure Give. And so I give you permission right now to go to the app store or the Google Play store if you're non-denominational. And... Um, and, and just go ahead. And just to show you how easy it is to set up a secure give, uh, there's a video. I don't know if we can play it, um, but, but if we can play This is a video of me, and I tried to do this myself, so it's going to be bad. But it's a screenshot of me setting up a secure give. Just see if you can play that video that's below the presentation there, uh, and, and let's see if it works. And so, but you can, you can go ahead and download secure give. I put up the logo there to make it. should be the first one when you search for uh, uh, secure give. No, it's not up. Oh, it was up the whole time? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's it. And so this is me, and it's downloading slowly because apparently my Wi-Fi was really slow that day. Um, but, uh, but that's it. <clears throat> Those of you that uh, normally give, the reason I want you to, uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm putting this in here, um, many of you give regularly, and, and I'm grateful for that generosity. Some of you give digitally. Some of you are from a generation that doesn't write a check. So we open it. When you finally download it, you open it. That's a shot. It asks you some questions like, are you sure, bro? Like, you, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is location, and these churches are nearby. Co Church at the Well, Daystar, Coleman, FBC. Pick us. And, <laughs> and then, like, like down. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it says, like, make a donation, pledge, which added the, uh, the flag or something. I'm not sure. I don't know what that one is. But make a donation, you click, and that brings you this page, and you can create an account, and you'll be up and running. Um, if that's helpful to you, um, I, I know the, the, the way people give changes. It used to be, you know, a million years ago it was cash, and, or it was like probably livestock or whatever. I guess you could still bring a chicken or something. But, um, but, but then cash, then check. But I know a lot of people, they don't, even, they don't even carry cash, and it's a different world. So I wanted to make that, uh, make you at least aware of that. That's a secure give. And last one, you still got your phone out? You're like, oh, yeah, I've been playing Angry Birds this whole time. It, last one, um, your attention. Uh, do you have a Bible app of any sort already loaded? If you don't, it, there, there, there's a million of them. But, um, you know, I, I, I bought a book to go through an Advent devotional every single day. Um, and then I was given another one that's better, so I'm going to use the one that was given to me. But um, that starts on December 1st. There are so many daily devotions. Would you just kind of commit, you know, to pick one? I've got, I, I got my Bible app, and I, like I said, I, I kind of picked one. They'll send you verses every day. If you're already doing something, then this message is clearly not... Like, for you, you understand? If you're already doing that, check. If you're already giving, keep giving. That, that's fine. This is for somebody else then. Um, but have you considered how you are going to, by the end of this Christmas, by, by the end of this season, I should say, by the end of Advent, when the time we get to Christmas, have you considered how you are going to strategize as a, as a family, as a church family, where it will not be King Jesus who's left off the plate? And you say, well, I don't know, this seems silly, like, like, to do all these things. It almost feels like we're, like, doing stuff and not just hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. It's application. And if you say, well, I don't want to apply it that way, I want to apply it a different way. I don't want to give to First Baptist. I want to give to a, a Compassion Internet or some other church. Great! Do that! But let's make sure that King Jesus doesn't get left off the plate. Last thing I'll say, why? What on earth would motivate a group of people to give of the best that they have. You know, I know money, people always talk about, oh, that you shouldn't talk about money, that's weird. But honestly, people's greatest resource is not their money, it's their time. So how can you ask somebody to give of money and give of time? I mean, why would you do that? To give your attention to something? Why would you do that? Why would any group of people, you, you, you shouldn't do it because some man asked you to, just a human being. They have no right or authority. But could it be that this church is so generous with their time, Yes, with their money and with their attention. Could it not be because this church is filled with people who've been radically touched by the Savior's love? And could it not be that the gospel has so taken root in people's hearts that they realize 
He who had everything gave up everything so that he wouldn't stay away, so that he would come and be the way, right? And enter in as a little baby in a manger in Bethlehem. And he lost everything so that he wouldn't lose you. And out of that gospel good news overflows generosity. And I've seen you, church, the way you volunteer your time, the way you volunteer your resources, you surrender your money for the Lord's use, the way you, 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 you give your attention to the things of God. It's an overflow of the gospel. And my prayer for my own family and for this church is that if anything gets left off this season, because something's going to get left out, it won't be King Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the good gifts you've given us. We thank you for the good gifts you gave Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, so many years ago, all those good things. And God, grant us the grace to never allow a good thing to become the enemy of the best. God, grant that if something gets left off the, the whole buffet of holiday choices, God, let it not be your precious son. And God, grant us to be doers of the word, to strategize. If my simple applications aren't the right ones for people, Holy Spirit, speak to each heart and touch them and tell them what is the thing they need to do to strategize thoughtfully ahead of time how they're going to start at the back of the buffet. Grant us that wisdom, Lord, to apply your word in a way that glorifies you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For our time of response,